Welcome. My name is Ray Kramer, and I welcome you on behalf of our co-sponsoring organizations. As with all events in, in which the Syracuse Peace Council is involved, we want to acknowledge that we are on Haudenosaunee land and to thank our Haudenosaunee neighbors for their good fellowship and friendship. We also note their commitment to peace, justice, democratic decision-making, and environmental stewardship. There are many lessons for us to learn from them despite our less than noteworthy interactions in the past. We <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> we are grateful to Leah and Greta and the other peacemakers for this opportunity tonight to learn and hopefully build on the solidarity of our shared commitment to end or at least reduce the impact of militarism, war making, and profiteering on our lives and Mother Earth. I also want to invite you to join us on April 22nd, Earth Day at a non-arrest demonstration event at the Hancock Air National Guard Base. This is in North Syracuse. Uh, we are planning to be there to honor our need to nurture the earth and remind those who despoil it in arrogance and greed that there is another path to take. Uh, we have been a presence for the soldiers on that base for many years now. And we encourage anyone who wants to, to join us. Um, for more information, see the Syracuse Peace Council website. Uh, and now I want to introduce someone who I, in the classic cliche, doesn't need an introduction. And that's Greta Zaro, uh, currently organizing director for World Without War. Greta, thank you for your help in putting this together. Great, thank you so much, Ray. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Greta Zaro. I'm the organizing director with World Beyond War, and I'm based just about an hour and a half away from Syracuse. So this feels like a local online event for me today. Um, World Beyond War is excited to be co-hosting today's webinar. Closing military bases is one of the three core pillars of our work. Base closure is something that we see as a critical step towards an alternative global security system. And Leah Bolger, who is our speaker tonight, heads up our closed bases campaign at World Beyond War. Leah Bolger retired in 2000 from the US Navy at the rank of commander after 20 years of active duty service. Leah received an MA in National Security and Strategic Affairs from the Naval War College in 1994 and was chosen to be the Navy Military Fellow at the MIT Security Studies Program in 1997. After retirement, she became very active in Veterans for Peace and was elected as the first woman president, national president in 2012. Later that year, she was part of a 20 person delegation to Pakistan to meet with the victims of US drone strikes. She is the creator and coordinator of the Drones Quilt Project, a traveling exhibit which serves to educate the public and recognize the victims of US combat drones. Leah currently serves as the president of the board of directors of World Beyond War. After Leah's presentation, we will have Q&A and discussion. You can put your questions in the chat box at any time tonight, or you can also use the Zoom raise hand feature to raise your virtual hand and we can call on you during the Q&A period. You can click on reactions, which should be at the bottom of your screen to raise your virtual hand. If you're having any trouble, just let us know in the chat. If you can't find the virtual raise hand, just let us know in the chat and we'll call on you. Um, and if you're dialing from a telephone, press star nine to raise your hand. We will repeat all of these instructions again before the Q&A period. Um, and we're also recording and live streaming this webinar today and we will send out the recording afterwards. So with that, Leah, take it away. Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining me today um, on this webinar about military bases. I am going to share screen with you here and hopefully this will all work like it's supposed to. Play from start. Ah, brilliant. Okay, so um, first of all, before I, I really get into this, uh, uh, just a couple of caveats. 
Uh, because I'm an American and because we're talking about the US military, I use the word we all the time. And I, if you're not an American and you don't have anything to do with this country in that, in that respect, um, that's what I mean when I say we. Also, I'm gonna use the word troops and that's just a generic word for any military personnel that's, that's, uh, that I'm speaking of. But uh, Navy people don't like to be called troops. <laughs> so anyway, don't wanna offend anybody. Okay. Um, so people ask me where I've been stationed, um, and I put this up here so you can take a quick look at it. Um, but just note uh, the four uh, red duty stations are overseas. So I have had some experience actually living um, on the military bases. Uh oh, why won't my slide advance? Oh, no, 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 no. Come on. I can go backwards, but uh, I don't know what to do. Let's... Why don't you exit the slides, the pres presentation view? And I'm, then you I can am, slide. I'm just not doing anything when I hit escape. There. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now click go on number two. Click on number three. Okay, hopefully okay. this is going to, um, and, and I need to play. There. Okay, hopefully this is going to let me advance. I don't know, that's the first time I've had that glitch. All right. <clears throat> So um, the first uh, American military bases were created in the form of forts that sprang up as the US Army Cavalry units moved across North America. The philosophy of manifest destiny, a belief in the inherent superiority of white Americans, as well as the conviction that they were destined by God to conquer the territories of North America, was used to justify the fighting, killing, and displacing of thousands of indigenous natives to make way for white settlers moving west. The first of these bases, Fort Harmer, was formed in 1785 and was situated on the Ohio River near what is now the city of Marietta. At its peak, the number of U.S. Army forts totaled 90, and some of these forts are still operating. For example, Fort Meade, located in Maryland just north of Washington, D.C., was built in 1878 and is currently the home of Defense Information Systems, U.S. Cyber Command, the National Security Agency, and the Army Band. The global military presence of the US began on 2 September 1940 when FDR and Churchill made a private secret agreement for the US to transfer 50 World War I vintage destroyers to England in exchange for 99 year leases to seven British air and naval bases in Newfoundland, Bermuda, the Bahamas and several small Caribbean islands. The concept of creating and maintaining foreign military bases is something that really only became a thing in the post-World War II era, as the defeated nations, Germany, Japan, and Italy, were all forced to accept permanent installations from the US. World War II had devastated all of Europe, leaving the US a late entrant into the war as the sole remaining superpower. This is important because it meant that the US was one of the few nations that was even capable of setting up such an international system. The Korean and Cold War sped up the expansion of US military infrastructure to other countries. The US continued to set up posts all over the globe to ensure a geopolitical foothold in every place that they believed to be vulnerable to Soviet influence, which basically meant everywhere. Sometimes when I show this map to people, it is a real revelation for uh, them to see that the, the United States military actually divides up the world into geographic sections uh, by which they can command them. So there are six of them by geography. Um, uh, US AFRICOM is the latest. Uh, I, when I was stationed in Tunisia, uh, AFRICOM was not a thing. We were, we were governed by UCOM. Um, so you, AFRICOM is new. Um, there are also, in addition to these six, uh, the Special Operations Command, uh, Strategic Command, which is nuclear weapons, uh, Transcom for transportation, and the latest Spacecom. US has around 200,000 personnel troops 
stationed overseas with the heaviest numbers in the countries that were losers in World War II, as I mentioned, and residual troops in South Korea for the war that hasn't been declared over yet. The US has more than 800 bases, and some estimates are more than 1,000, in 80 countries and all seven continents. Additionally, the US maintains secret facilities whose number and location are classified. One of the reasons it is impossible to say definitively how many bases there are is the lack of clarity about what a base is. Some like Ramstein Air Base in Germany are the size of small cities and are sometimes called little Americas. Others, what are known as cooperative security locations or lily pads can pop up very quickly and may have just a handful of personnel stationed on them. If you'll note the circle size and the color, you'll see that there is heavy location in Europe and uh, Japan, um, just as I mentioned before. In AFRICOM, we have now uh, 39 bases in 13 countries and, and those are popping up very quickly. You also have to remember that in addition to these 800 to 1000 bases, there are um, carrier strike groups, aircraft carriers uh, accompanied by four to seven support ships, uh, a submarine, uh, dozens and dozens of aircraft and hundreds of missiles. Uh, and those aircraft carriers can be maneuvered quickly um, anywhere. Right now there are three of them in the South China Sea area. Here are some examples of uh, the lily pad on the left, Chabeli Airfield in Djibouti. And you can see this is probably not a duty station people are asking to be stationed at. Uh, and on the right is a Ramstein Air Base, which is, is very big. This picture um, only shows the air, air strip, but it's, it's quite large. There are about 34,000 people living there, including family members. And when you have family members at a, at a military station, you have to have all these amenities to support the family so it feels like they're living in, a, in an American city. And wherever there are, are um, uh, here, oh, here we go, some pictures. The upper left is a hospital. Um, the exchange is on the, the, similar to a target, I would say. Um, and then the fitness center here, you can see with rows and rows of uh, uh, training, uh, training uh, machines. Um, and wherever you see Americans, you're going to see fast food. And you see on the left here, there's a, a McDonald's in uh, Afghanistan. Um, the, the middle one, I just love, and uh, I want to read this, <clears throat> the, the, the sign that's on this uh, counter at Popeye's restaurant. Due to the Pakistan border closing, our food shipments have been delayed. Popeye's will temporarily close until our food shipments resume. We apologize for the inconvenience. Oh, I'm so sorry. Oh. oh, forgive me. I've lost my track in my, okay. All right. <clears throat> Why does the United States want these spaces? Well, um, they come out with vision statements um, every few years. And the one that we're operating under now is called full spectrum dominance. Uh, the United States wants to dominate every facet of air, uh, air, land, sea, and outer space now. Um, they need the basis to preposition because there's quite a long supply chain. Uh, fuel, for example, is a, is a really, a uh, big problem to have to, to supply because the equipment tanks uh, use so much gas. Actually, it's, it's measured in gallons per mile rather than miles per gallon. So you have to get the fuel to the tanks and you use the fuel, getting the fuel to the tanks. And it's quite a long problem as you can imagine. They want the bases to protect and acquire natural resources and trade routes. Um, I've written here AWOL, which means a, a way without leave, but it also stands for American way of life. Um, and and that, um, that the United States citizens tend to feel like they're entitled to uh, the resources that belong to other countries. Uh, and American soldiers are willing to die for oil. I met a, I met a young man who had been an a Afghanistan vet and we were talking about uh, the war and he said, well, you know what the war's all about, aren't you, uh, don't you? Or we're talking about Iraq actually. And, he, and I said, uh, yeah, I, th I think I do. And he said, it's for oil. And I said, yes. 
Uh, and he said, I said, are you really willing to risk your life for oil? And he said, yes, absolutely. For the American way of life, he was, he was willing to die for that. Another a major reason that uh, the United States likes to have bases in other countries is so that they can um, do joint exercises with the local military and use their facilities like ports and airports and, and um, naval ports. Why do some countries want them? Well, they do provide some jobs and they do bring in some dollars, but the economy can actually be damaged by these military facilities. So I will talk about that a little bit later. Djibouti right now is, in, for instance, getting itself into a really difficult economic situation with China as they've taken out huge extensive loans to build the infrastructure for the base that China is, is forming there in Djibouti. So you can get yourself into a debt trap uh, pretty easily uh, with all the borrowing and that's what's happening there. So foreign aid, um, Americans think of foreign aid as money for food or medicine and that kind of thing. But actually about a third of the US foreign aid budget is given in the form of weapons and ammunition. For, for some countries, all of their aid is military like Israel, which, which gets over $3 billion a year. My job in Tunisia had to do with foreign aid. I worked at the Office of Defense Cooperation, which is not a part of a base, it is attached to the embassy. So in Tunisia, there was a military presence, but there was no base there. So the, um, there are countries that don't have bases that also have military. So that, that figure of 80 countries is actually more than that. So the ODC uh, had officers from each of the services who worked with their counterparts in the host country. I had three components to my job. One was planning joint exercises between the, the local military and the American military. Um, the second was foreign military sales where uh, the United States sells at discount prices the equipment or gives it, gives it away. Uh, but then that forces the, the, the host country to purchase ammunition and training and some spare parts, that kind of thing. So there's no such thing as a, as a free tank, I guess I should say. Um, and the third part was Ill, uh, international military education training. And it is a program that uh, allocates, allocates money to, to different countries to send their military folks to the United States for training, um, English training and uh, things like tank repair school, that kind of stuff. So there's three, three components to my job there. And it was a, a, it was a very interesting job, I, I have to say. I, I learned a lot there. So why should we close these bases? Uh, well, the main reason is that they heighten tension. The presence of almost 200,000 troops, massive arsenals, and thousands of aircraft, tanks, and ships in every corner of the earth present a very real threat to surrounding nations. Their presence is a permanent reminder of the military capacity of the United States and are a provocation to other nations. Even worse for heightened tensions, the resources housed on these bases are used for military exercises, which is essentially war practice. They facilitate war. The preposition of weapons, troops, communications equipment, aircraft, fuel, etc., make the logistics for US aggression quicker and more efficient. Because the US is continually creating plans for military actions around the world, and because the US military always has some troops on the ready, the initiation of combat operations is very simple. Dr. David Vine, professor of anthropology at American University, is the author of Base Nation and the United States of War, says that the presence of bases makes war actually more likely. Rather than deterring potential adver adversaries, U.S. bases antagonize other countries into greater military spending and aggression. Russia, for example, justifies its interventions in Georgia and Ukraine by pointing to encroaching U.S. bases in Eastern Europe. China feels encircled by the more than 250 U.S. bases in the region, not to mention the aircraft carriers, which has led to a more assertive policy in the South China Sea. In the Middle East in particular, U.S. bases and troops have provoked terrorist threats, radicalization, and anti-American propaganda. Bases near Muslim holy sites in Saudi Arabia were a major recruiting tool for Al-Qaeda. The danger in host countries Countries which have US military assets stationed on them become targets for attack themselves in response to any US military aggression. 
They house nuclear weapons. Effective the 22nd of January, 2021, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons took effect. Nuclear weapons belonging to the US are positioned in five European countries, Belgium, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, and Turkey, countries which do not have nuclear weapons themselves. The possibility of an accident or becoming a target could be especially catastrophic. World Beyond War is working with activists in Europe to pressure their governments to get the weapons out of their countries. Even more reasons. They support dictators and repressive undemocratic regimes. Scores of US bases in more than 40 authoritarian and less than democratic countries, including Bahrain, Turkey, Thailand, and Niger. These bases are a sign of support for governments implicated in murder, torture, suppressing democratic rights, oppressing women and minorities, and other human rights abuses. Far from spreading democracy, bases abroad often block it instead. Estimates of the yearly cost of US foreign military bases range from 100 to $250 billion. According to the United Nations, world hunger could be ended for the cost of only $3 billion. Just imagine what could be done with an additional 97 billion. They deny land to indigenous populations from Panama to Guam to Puerto Rico to Okinawa to dozens of other locations across the world. The military has taken valuable land from local populations, often pushing out indigenous people in the process without their consent and without reparations. For example, between 1967 and 1973, the entire population of the Chagos Islands, almost 1,500 people, was forcibly removed from the island of Diego Garcia by the UK so that it could be leased to the US for an air base. The Chagosian people were taken off their island by force and transported in conditions compared to those of slave ships. They were not allowed to take anything with them and their animals were destroyed before their eyes. The Chagosians have petitioned the British government many times for return of their home and their situation has been addressed by the United Nations. Despite an overwhelming vote of the UN General Assembly and an advisory opinion by the International Court of Justice in The Hague that the island should be returned to the Chagosians, the UK has refused and the US continues operations from Diego Garcia today. I recently read this in an article from CNN about Diego Garcia. The secret Diego Garcia military base may be a thousand miles from the nearest continent, but it has all the trappings of a modern American town. The troops here can dine on burgers at Jake's place, enjoy a nine hole golf course, go bowling or sink a cold beer at one of several bars. The local, com the local command has been nicknamed, the, has nicknamed the base, the footprint of freedom. There's irony there. Um, they can cause real economic problems for host countries. Um, the rise in property taxes and inflation in areas surrounding US bases has been known to push locals out of their homes to seek more affordable areas. Um, two of my duty stations in Yokosuka, Japan and in Bermuda, um, in Yokosuka especially, um, there was not enough room on the base to house all the people who were stationed there. So the military gives, the, gives people money to rent apartments and houses off base. And they can afford to give, uh, the, the American government gives um, the American service people uh, more money than the, you, than the uh, local citizens can keep up with. So it, it prices their, their own housing uh, out of their own income bracket. So um, many of the communities hosting bases overseas never see the economic windfalls that the US and local leaders regularly promise. Some areas, especially in poor rural communities have seen short-term economic booms touched off by base construction. In the long term, however, most bases rarely create sustainable, healthy local economies. Compared with other forms of economic activity, they represent unproductive uses of land, employ relatively few people for the expanses occupied, and contribute little to local economic growth. Research has consistently shown that when bases finally close, the economic impact is generally limited and in some cases actually positive. That is, local communities can and 
end up better off when they trade bases for housing, schools, shopping complexes, and other forms of economic development. They station, your, um, they station American troops who commit crimes. There's a long history on the Japanese island of Okinawa of the local population suffering violent crime at the hands of the American military, including kidnapping, rape, and the murders of women and girls. Additionally, prostitution is perpetuated near US bases. The most recent problem with Americans in bases is that um, they violate local health precautions with regard to COVID. Up until July, COVID had largely spared Okinawa who were abiding by strict protocols. There had been fewer than 150 infections and only seven deaths among a population of nearly 1.5 million to that point in July. Though an international travel ban was in place, US military personnel were exempt and incoming Americans brought COVID with them, but the bases weren't locked down and the cases started showing up in the community. It's another instance of American exceptionalism and no concern for cultural norms. Most country agreements were made in the years before many environmental regulations were in place. And even now the standards and laws that have been created for the US do not apply to US foreign military bases. There are no enforcement mechanisms for host countries to apply to ensure adherence to local environmental regulations either. And they may not even be permitted to do inspections due to the status of forces agreements between the countries. Moreover, when a base is returned to the host country, there are no requirements for the US to clean up the damage it has caused or even disclose the presence or location of certain toxins like Agent Orange or depleted uranium. I tried to find some uh, figures to, to show you um, uh, the, the lack of money they put behind it, but it's very difficult to find. The only thing I could find uh, was from 1998, well over 20 years ago. And the cost they had allocated just to clean up two things, fuel and firefighting foam or PFAS, uh, they had allocated uh, $2.13 billion in, uh, for domestic bases in 1998, $2.13 billion, and for foreign bases, uh, $25 million for all the foreign bases. So you can see that it, it's not, uh, money is not put into as a line item in the DOD budget for a military, for cleanup of environment overseas. And depending on the SOFA, the U.S. may not have to fund any of it at all. Uh, there's uh, base commanders. If there's going to be any cleanup, the base commanders end up using their own operating money and not a line item from the DOD. There are other types of pollution as well. The exhaust of U.S. planes and vehicles cause significant degradation of air quality. Toxic chemicals from the bases enters the local water sources and jets create enormous noise pollution which they like to call the sound of freedom. This, uh, this one in the lower left, that's actually the, the gate in front of the Cherry Point um, uh, air station. And I have seen myself uh, painted on um, hangers, aircraft hangers, I've seen that as the sound of freedom. The construction of some of the bases has caused permanent ecological damage. For instance, at Jeju Island, South Korea, an area designated as an absolute conservation area and a UNESCO biosphere conservation area. And despite strong opposition by inhabitants of Jeju Island, a deep water port is being constructed for use by the US, which is destroying the coral reefs. This is a map of Japan and Okinawa. The hot, this, this island is Hokkaido. We have Honshu, the main island. Shikoku and Kyushu, and way down here, this little red dot is uh, Okinawa. So as I noted, um, there are a lot of bases and personnel stationed in, in Japan, but Okinawa contains the lion's share of them. With uh, The island is only 6% of the total landmass of Japan, but it holds 60 of the bases and it covers 20% 20, 20 of their very small island. You can see here the, um, uh, the colored areas that indicate different military facilities. Down here is Futenma Air Station. Um, it is being closed and another uh, facility is being built 
Um, here's Futenma from the air. You can see how crowded it is. Um, this is a Marine Corps, Marine Corps station there. So right now they're in the process of building a new location for the Marine Corps in Hanoko. Um, they're trying to move half the, half the Marines there and the other half are supposed to go to Guam, uh, which doesn't want them either, but, um, but that's the plan. So um, Japan forcibly began land reclamation in 2018, despite 70% of the Okinawan people saying they didn't want it. From the beginning, there have been constant protests. The original cost was set to be 8.5 billion, but now it looks to be at least double that because of the incredibly difficult engineering problems they have to overcome. The, the seabed there is described as mayonnaise-like. It's completely soft. And you can imagine it's very difficult to, uh, to build anything of any, any uh, substance over that kind of a seabed. And to make matters worse, they're, now they're, they're getting the, the dirt, uh, the land to, to do the backfilling with from a northern part of um, uh, Okinawa that are burial grounds they're digging up and desecrating. And what's really absurd is that this area is, sits on two fault lines and uh, could very easily be just completely destroyed from an earthquake. And there were several earthquakes when I was stationed there for two years. So it's, it's crazy all the way around. There's another problem in that it, um, it's endangering this, um, uh, this animals. It's called a dugong. It's a type of sea cow related to a manatee. There are several types of dugong, and one of them is already extinct due to overfishing. So they're trying to protect this species. The construction uh, is destroying the shallow seagrass habitat that they live in. Now, Okinawa uh, is not the only place that there is resistance that the, the local people want the Americans to leave. They want the bases closed. Um, these are pictures from Okinawa, Japan, South Korea, Italy, Germany, Australia, and Pakistan. There are a few success stories, not very many that I could find, uh, but Vieques uh, is an island municipal principality of Puerto Rico. In 1941, Roosevelt Road's naval station on the mainland of Puerto Rico acquired it for a bombing range and testing ground displacing the sugar workers that were there. The range was widely used and was even leased to other countries for bombing practice. But one time a civilian security guard was killed when two F-A-18 Hornet jets took off from the USS John F. Kennedy aircraft carrier to carry out a bombing practice run and missed their target by three miles. Increased protests and civil disobedience led to closure in 2003, and now the island is a wildlife refuge. In Ecuador, when uh, Rafael Correra was running for president, a campaign promise he made was a promise not to renew a 10-year lease with the United States government for a military base. A referendum made a change in the, in the Ecuadorian constitution that officially prohibited foreign military bases on Ecuadorian soil. Carrera said, if I can have a base in Miami, you can have a base in Ecuador. And that, that statement makes you feel, uh, see how preposterous that idea would be to an American to imagine having a base in this country. Um, and it's just as, as preposterous the other way around. The Philippines is a very complicated story. Um, the United States has a military presence there since 1898 when it was captured from Spain. The deep sea port at Subic Bay has always played a big part in US naval operations. Under Corazon Aquino, public sentiment turned against the US, which felt like they were being treated uh, like lackeys and they wanted to reassert their sovereignty it, as a matter of national pride. And despite the loss of economic benefits, in 1991, Philippine Senate rejected renewal of the lease and Aquino gave uh, until the end of 1992 for the United States to be out and they did leave on November 24th of 1992. However, in response to Chinese presence, exercises in the disputed Spratly Islands came back to the United States 
and in 1998 created a visiting forces agreement and established new rules for US personnel. It established annual joint military exercise Balak, Balak, Balakatan, I think that's how you pronounce it. It means shoulder to shoulder in, um, in Tagalog and added an enhanced defense cooperation agreement, which allows a rotation of conventional forces through Philippine military bases and the Navy ships are porting in Subic Bay again. President Duarte has said that he wants to end the, F, uh, the VFA, but um, the, that is frozen, it's put on hold again until this June, they're supposed to make a decision about that. So the World Beyond War No Basis Campaign, um, my, my vision for, for it, for World Beyond War is to become a hub for all things uh, American foreign military bases. Um, I'd like to, uh, us to be the, the repository of, of uh, archives of articles and data and history and a place where activists can hook up and, and all kinds of things. So um, I'm really working to um, make this a, a really important uh, component in the, uh, the movement to abolish war. And because we have members in 189 countries, we are well suited to work on this issue. We have people in all those countries that have American bases. We have the capacity to facilitate networking between all these activists and, and citizens of those countries. We can do education webinars like this one. We can promote and support in-country resistance. We can create actions, coordinate, um, and, uh, and be a, just an overall um, source, resource. Now, one of the things that the United States, uh, excuse me, that World Beyond War is involved with is um, OBRAC or the Overseas Base Realignment and Closure Coalition. The BRAC, a Base Realignment and Closure Committee is something that the DOD has and they do it periodically, BRAC inspections of, of domestic bases in the United States. And the DOD will make recommendations to close bases, but then Congress will say no, because they have that, that base happens to be in their district. And, and so the, the, it's very difficult to close a base in the United States. However, um, outside the country um, it is, is much easier. And so um, David Vine, as I mentioned earlier, put together this coalition of people uh, from different, several different sectors, um, military, uh, retired people like myself, um, scholars, think tank people. We have a, a prior member of Congress. And um, when Trump was in office, we wrote a letter to him and uh, Secretary of Defense Mathis at the time uh, in Congress outlining nine reasons that the bases should be closed and providing a fact sheet as well. Uh, just um, the other day, in fact, right now, we are in the middle of pre uh, presenting a, um, a revised updated letter to President Biden um, and Secretary Austin in Congress uh, with the same uh, reasons and fact, uh, fact sheets and trying to convince them that U.S. bases, uh, these bases need to be closed. Biden has announced that he is doing a, a, a posture review uh, to look at all the, all the assets around the world. So we're hopeful that this will, uh, will be a good opportunity for um, basis to get some scrutiny. Um, so I, I call this effort working with OBRAC um, the inside strategy because um, these people that have contacts with Congress, I tell you, it's been very eye-opening for me who had never had any clue how things happened uh, behind the scenes to get laws passed and, and all that. And you really, you have to know somebody. And uh, it's, been, it's been really uh, a, quite a, an education for me. So that's the inside strategy. And um, the, the OBRAC has uh, partnered with the Quincy Institute, you may have heard of, which is a, a transpartisan, uh, they call themselves a transpartisan um, think tank uh, with people from, um, from all sides of points of view. Um, we're holding a webinar tomorrow uh, at 1 p.m. Eastern on uh, closing military bases. Uh, Andrew Basevich, uh, who is a retired West Point um, officer, um, is, the, is the president of Quincy Institute. He'll be mod moderating um, the panel and it um, has some great guests. Uh, one of them is David uh, Vine, who I mentioned earlier. 
Um, uh, Christine Ahn is another, and um, the other person is John Glazer from Cato Institute. So that's the inside strategy. The outside strategy, um, we work with a coalition against US foreign military bases, which has uh, a number of charter member organizations you can see there. Um, and we, uh, all these organizations, uh, uh, some, it's very difficult for all of these organizations in any kind of this kind of numbers to agree on everything. But the issue of closing the bases is something that all of these groups agree on. And so that is what we've come together uh, around. Um, and the coalition does things like um, uh, conferences. We had one in Baltimore. Uh, we had one in, in Ireland. Um, there was another one planned for Cyprus, but uh, COVID uh, put that one out of business. Um, but we work on petitions, uh, uh, you know, things that people can see, protests, and that sort of stuff would, would fall under that outside strategy that I was talking about. So if you want to get involved with the World Beyond War efforts to close the military bases, the first thing you can do to get involved with any of our work to be a really help, helpful is to join our membership by taking this pledge. And you can find the pledge on our website. Uh, add your name to this pledge saying, I commit to engage in and support nonviolent efforts to end all war and preparations for war and to create a sustainable and just peace. So when you do that, you become part of the World Beyond War uh, membership and you will, be, uh, you will get messages from us on how you can get involved. Uh, and if specifically, if you want to get involved with a, with a basis campaign, we can use people to do research, data entry, all kinds of things that, uh, or, or things that you have to think more and, and write or whatever. We have a job for anybody who wants one. Uh, so just contact us at info.worldbeyondwar.org and we will put you to work. So I am now ready to take any questions you might have. Great, thank you so much, Leah. So again, we will be using the chat box as one option, or you can also raise your virtual hand, click on the reactions tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen and then click raise hand, or just let us know in the chat if you're having problems and want us to call on you. Um, okay, I see one question already from Steve. What counter argument would you give to those who say that the violent crimes of stationed US troops are just an accidental side effect? the consequence of a few bad eggs. Well, that may be true, but they wouldn't happen at all if we weren't stationed there. You know, here's the, here's the real problem. The status of forces agreement um, will prohibit um, extradition to the, the local police. For, so if, if, a, if a, a Marine uh, rapes a woman off base, um, the Japanese uh, uh, judicial system doesn't handle the case. That person is turned over to the United States uh, and it's, it's handled that way and punished that way. So um, as you can imagine, that's, uh, that's not a good situation for uh, public relations. So um, it, yeah, there's, you're, gonna have, you're gonna have crime, uh, but uh, there's no, no reason for it to happen in the first place. And I think you know, there, it wouldn't be so bad if the local government could handle the prosecution of the crimes. Another question, Leah, um, can you share a little bit more about your personal story and what, you know, made you make the transition to peace activism? You could probably tell this by now, uh, Greta, she's, <laughs> she's heard me give it many times. I get this question all the time and it's only natural. Uh, in a nutshell, um, I would tell people that I am a product of, the, of Missouri public education and I did not know very much at all about um, American imperialism and militarism and the reasons for war. Um, I have a degree in fine art. My BFA is my undergraduate degree. I needed a job and um, I became an officer. And so it was a decent starting salary. Um, it sounded very exotic to me to live in uh, overseas places. I grew up and went to college in a very small town in Missouri, 13,000 people. So I wanted to get out of there. I wanted a job. And, and that's really uh, so it wasn't that I transformed from warrior to peacenik. I transferred from being uh, somebody that was kind of ambivalent and unknowledgeable about uh, our history and, and someone needing a job to someone out of it who, who now, uh, you know, I can, I can, I know more now and I've, I've been, uh, I've learned more about it. Um, and so now, um, now I'm out, but I, I, it wasn't, it wasn't from warrior to peacenik. It was kind of like neutral to 
anti-war. Um, can you tell us more about what you mentioned in terms of Biden doing um, a review of the current situation? Speak more to what that means and, and what you know, potentially that could lead to. Right, right. Well, uh, Biden, uh, shortly after he took office, said that he wanted to do, and I'm, and I'm not going to remember the exact wording, what they call it, a, 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 a review, a full, um, full force review of all uh, DOD assets, where they're stationed, number of ships, uh, aircraft, uh, all that kind of thing, um, so that he could um, create with General Austin um, a uh, a vision, I guess. Uh, DOD and the president will come up with their, their vision. And right now, like I told you, it's full spectrum dominance. So that kind of thing is important to, to assess where we are, where the assets are. So in doing this assessment, um, this is the perfect time to, to push this idea of, hey, bases are, might be a great place to start. And that letter that Obrecht sent to Biden um, I, I should really stress the point that OBRAC is made of people on the left and the right, and John Glazer from Cato is certainly not on the left-hand side of politics. So the latter outlines reasons such as we have um, uh, technology that um, it keeps the United States safe in other ways. We don't need the, the base um, we don't need the space because we have um, some weapon or whatever that does the same job. So that's not why we want to close the bases. We want all the bases closed. We want all the weapons done away with. But we found this common ground and uh, the bases cost a lot of money. So they're always looking to find money that they can cut. Um, so this seems like an obvious way to find something that people can agree on uh, that will definitely reduce militarism um, and, 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 and help in other ways as well. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how the closed bases strategy fits within the larger world beyond war strategy of the alternative global security system and why we see that as, as one of the critical steps towards that? Sure. Well, you know, when World Beyond War was formed, the idea was to push back against the institution of war and not the war of the day. We're trying to get at the whole, the whole uh, machine here. And, you know, that's what's different about us, I think. And, and so the first thing we, we did is try to create a strategy um, for, doing, for doing this, transitioning from a, a global security system that's based on war and the threat of war and our economic sanctions to one that's based on international law and diplomacy and mediation. So our strategy, which is, is um, discussed in our book, our alternative global security system book, or AGSS, we call it, now it's fifth edition, it's always being updated, breaks that uh, into three components. And the first is demilitarizing security. And the second is uh, uh, co resolving conflicts and what, what's the exact term? Uh, Nonviolently resolving- Managing conflict, conflict nonviolently. Nonviolently, yeah. And the third is building a culture of peace. So the demilitarizing security is, is really, really critical. And if you can, you know, you think about, well, how do we dismantle war? It was, it's how, where do you start? You know, where do you start doing that? So we look at the, the things that are outward expressions of militarism and threat, threat of war. And the, the bases are, are a very good example of that. We actually picked this campaign um, uh, and the divestment campaign Greta mentioned after a long year long process of, of strategic planning to find a way that we could focus in the best way that we could use our resources and, and our uh, capacity to a, attack a discrete area um, uh, that is a big part of war. So yes, we could close the bases and war uh, that wouldn't abolish war, but the present, but we're not going to abolish war while we still have bases there, you see. So closing them down uh, would make, well, you saw, you know, I, I mentioned about how um, China is now building a, a base in Djibouti. Why are they doing that? Because they feel threatened by the aircraft carriers and the 250 bases the United States has in Japan. So, you know, it, it, we can only expect our, quote, enemies to uh, respond accordingly. If we back off, they back off. And, and uh, so if the United States would do that, pull back, I think it would just have such a huge um, uh, consequence uh, of response from, from other countries. 
Great, thanks. And don't be shy, everyone. We have about nine minutes left for questions. So do put them in the chat or raise your virtual hand. Um, and let's go to Mark has a question. All right. Um, thanks, Leah. Uh, um, I've heard this before, but I always learn something new every time. Um, <laughs> My, my question is about um, possible intersections with movements raising awareness of say police abuse or privilege abuse, you know, from Black Lives Matter, which obviously you being in the Pacific Northwest, I, you know, you've seen a lot of the intense um, reaction, you know, to the George Floyd murder. And I'm just thinking this type of um, focus on privilege abuse, isn't that really relevant to what's going on in Okinawa or, um, you know, really the stories they tell are the same. Is there a way to sort of bridge the two to channel this energy um, of this protest movement, which is, you know, something we're always trying to do at World Beyond War to sort of intersect between movements. Right. Well, there, I mean, there's certainly, um, I think one of the things that, that people notice about American police um, is that it has over the years become militarized. And, uh, you know, we actually, they, the military gives police forces weapons. It's a 1033 program, I think is what it's called. So, um, our, our police has become more and more militarized. Wars that we get involved with are very racist. Uh, we, we don't attack countries with white populations. Um, and so, I mean, it, it all kind of goes hand in hand. And now you see the extremists, the violent people, that a lot of them are former military people. And this idea of might makes right. I mean, I think it just, it follows along with American um, our, our government, our, our society is, uh, has a long ways to go to, you know, to be equitable uh, and, 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 and just. So I, I think it, it does carry over and, and it's part of our culture too. I think, uh, you know, in the United States, military is honored, they're revered and they can do no wrong. And uh, the military is conflated with professional sports. And it's just, it's all this thing that we lift up as the, the pinnacle of, of uh, you know, other countries don't think of it that way. Uh, and it's, it's uh, uh, so I think it, it takes a huge change in, in thinking, uh, but they definitely go together. And, and there are lots of commonalities, I think, with uh, racism and militarism. Great, thanks. We have a couple more questions coming in. Um, Jean says, please talk about a pivot from militarism to combating climate change. You say there are about 200,000 people at these bases. They will need something to do if the bases are closed. Oh, oh, you're talking, uh, so what, what would the American military people do if the bases are closed? Well, I'm not, yeah, okay. Well, I don't think the troop troop in strength would go down. I think they would just station them in the States. We have. Um, there is plenty of housing and, and capacity to, uh, to keep the military domestic. So, um, you know, they, I don't think their jobs would uh, necessarily go away. They'd just be done in a different place. Certainly, we don't need the size military we have today. And gosh, I'm not even sure how many there are. I just know there's about how many that, that we have overseas. Um, um, of course, uh, you and I, I'm sure everybody else on this call probably believes that we, our, our military should be much, much, much smaller than it is. So um, I, don't, I don't really know how to tell you what those people would be doing, but it's not, it's not like overseas or nothing. It's, it's, you know, I don't know if that answered your question very well, but... Uh, Thanks. I'll move on to the next question because we have a few more coming in. Um, Reverend James says, do you recall why Cuba was not able to prevent the renewal of the lease for Guantanamo Bay Naval Base when the 99-year lease expired? How did the U.S. force the Cuban government to renew the lease? You know, I was asking somebody about that just the other day. Um, I, I don't understand that either. I, it's, maybe there's somebody on the call that's, on the, that's smarter about this than I do. I don't understand how it is that we can have sanctions or whatever and prevent people from, from, from uh, visiting or buying and, and everywhere. And we have a base on their, on their land. I don't get it at all. So I'm, I'm really not very knowledgeable about that, but um, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't, I'm not really smart on that at all. 
it, it just strikes me as so peculiar. Hmm. Um, okay, we do have a raised hand coming in from David. Uh, let's see, David, you can now unmute. Hey, ah, just... David, yes. <laughs> oh, everybody, this is David Vine, Professor Vine that I mentioned uh, more than once in my, in my uh, talk. Go ahead, David. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry to have been late, but um, quick, just quickly, um, there uh, as far as I know, there was never any 99 year lease. Basically the US government imposed on the Cuban government a lease that has no end date and that can only be canceled on the agreement of both governments, which is to say there is no lease because that's not a real lease if you know the supposed owner um, can't kick out the lessee. And I understand that Cuba is not uh, um, cashing the, the lease, the rent payments that we've been paying, is that right? Uh, certainly under Fidel Castro's reign, the, the, uh, it was reported that he would take the annual rent check and put it in his, uh, in his desk and, and not cash it. So I, I assume that remains the case. But I think the bottom line is Guantanamo Bay is a colony of the United States. It is, it's a colony of the United States. David, did I say anything um, that was not correct or you would like to um, elaborate on? And folks, if you have a question for David really is the guy, when I was doing um, research to, to write the, you know, the text for this, I, everything I Google, I find, oh, it's an article where they're quoting David Vine or a book by David Vine. Um, anyway, it's, uh, he's, if he's on the line asking questions. This is a great opportunity. Okay, great. I'm going to go to a question from Madison. Can you talk about what the effect has been of the U.S. exporting war to foreign countries and occupied states such that Americans do not see the direct impacts of their country's wars, like mass civilian casualties or the, or the destruction of infrastructure? How can we make it more clear um, the harm and scale of U.S. imperialism and militarism to apolitical Americans? This is such a hard problem. And, and, and it, it, in the United States, I believe that the people of the, of the United States do not really care about the issues of war and, and harming people in other countries. Number one, they don't know about it. They don't have any clue um, how, uh, what our foreign policy is. Just like when I was growing up, I didn't know anything. It's not on the news. It's not in the newspapers. It's not on your television. And the critical thing is that no Americans are dying. So as long as Americans don't die, you, know, you won't hear about it. And you have to be, you have to go out, you have to search for information about it now. You have to go to independent media and you have to do some digging uh, to find it. And, and media is the, is the big problem as well, because for instance, MSNBC, which people think of as a left on the left side of, of mainstream media, MSNBC owned by NBC, owned by GE, Oh, which also makes weapons. Now you see on uh, uh, MSNBC, uh, General uh, McCaffrey, Barry McCaffrey, he's like their resident uh, military guy. He sits on the board of DynCor. I mean, so everything you see in the media is supports war and those bad guys. And now you're seeing all this talk about how horrible China is and Russia is and the building this up, building this up to keep the machine going. So to get Americans interested in caring about other countries and what we're doing with our tax money is, is a huge, huge problem. But I think because they don't see it, because they don't see Americans dying, because they don't see pictures of children or whatever, it's just out of sight, out of mind. And, you know, let's all go to Walmart. Um, that's, <laughs> I don't know. It, it breaks my heart because I, I, I understand how, uh, yeah. To get me going. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that that just underscores the importance of the work that we're doing tonight and doing educational events that we can share with our contacts and get the word out there. And, and likewise, World Beyond War publishes books and does online courses to get this dialogue going. Um, but we are just about out of time, Leah. So do you have any concluding thoughts before we wrap up? Um, I just want to thank everybody for, for being on the webinar today. Um, and if you, please, if you haven't signed our pledge, please do that and, and ask your friends and family to sign it too. Because 
the way we grow, the way we solve the problem, the way we abolish the war is to do it together internationally uh, with a critical mass. And so we have 189 countries, but we only have a couple of people in some of those countries we need to build and it only takes a few to get the movement going. So please um, help us uh, support the work. You, if you can support us financially, that's fantastic. But if you can just give us your time and your energy and your thoughts and your, uh, your support, we'd love that too. So we're all in this together. Thanks for your help. Great, thank you, Leah. And I'm just gonna try to squeeze in one more question because I do see Anne Tiffany from Syracuse has a question. I wanna make sure that's included. So Anne, you can now unmute. Anne, you there? Okay. Uh, yes. Hi. This is Ed Canan who's sharing the screen with Anthony. <laughs> but Lee, I wanted to thank you for a really comprehensive uh, and succinct, useful presentation. And my question is that some of us on the on the uh, on the uh, program tonight are from Central New York, upstate New York. Right. Where for over a decade, we have been been resisting the uh, MQ9 killer drones at Hancock Air Base. Now, so my question is, uh, there are so many bases overseas. Do you have any sense for how many of them are actually drone bases as well? Mm -hmm. Any any profile of that drone yeah. exporting that you can give us? Yeah, I think uh, AFRICOM, all those bases, the 39 bases in AFRICOM, I think most of those are drone bases. Um, it, because they're like, I, I, they pop up, they don't need much at all in an airstrip, uh, you know. Um, so um, I, I think that they're, they're, that's where the majority of them are in, in that area, AFRICOM area. Um, because they don't want to spend the fuel, you know, to send a, a plane from, from the States, uh, you know, so they put the drones where they were going to use them. No, oh, no. Yeah. And they're easy to put all over. Yeah, oh, they're easy. Yeah, it's and see that's the problem. That's the other reason that the American um, and Congress loves drones because they don't cost very much and they don't get no Americans get killed and there's no accountability because when you kill somebody up in Waziristan in the hills and the mountains, nobody knows if you got the right guy or not. Nobody knows you know if you got anybody at all. So. Um, so that's what they like them. I mean, there's, they just can use them and they're effective and they, yeah. Leon Panetta said when he was the sec def, he said, they're the only game in town. That's, that was his feeling about drones. And, they're, and they've just been progressively more and more and more used. Uh, Bush two uh, W started it and then Obama uh, and, then, and then Trump and, and Biden. It's not going away. It's just ramping up. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Hey, one more plug too for the, the Quincy Institute webinar tomorrow. Um, it, it, please go to their website and register and get that Zoom link, uh, Quincy Institute, and get on their on their list too. There's lots of really good um, forums and, and um, lots of issues that are important for, for all of us to follow. Okay, great. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Leah, for your presentation. That's a wrap for now, and we will send the recording afterwards. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.